A beautiful Sunday afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am in back in Bergen County, New Jersey. It's Jimmy Noonan. My show is Noonan Speaks, June 3rd. I can't believe it's June already. And as usual, it's 1 o'clock here, but it is uh, my guest today is in another time zone. So uh, it's 12 o'clock where they are. I'm particularly excited about my guest today because I think she would probably agree with me that at the end of the day, the way you gauged a good day at WWE was respect. How you were respected backstage by the people, how you were respected and over or not over uh, with the audience, but just a general for me, it was all about respect, and that's what this person makes me think of. We were not overly, you know, affectionate or effusive, but it was just, hey, Jimmy, hey, Jazz, just a respectful thing as she's coming in, usually with one piece of luggage, sometimes two <laughs> pieces of luggage, sometimes two pieces of luggage because she had the championship belt with her. And it was just a pleasant exchange. Hey, Jimmy. Hey, Jazz. What's up? Boom. And we were good for the day because I felt the respect. And I'll always thank her for that. So, obviously, my guest today is former two-time WWE Women's World Champion. Jazz, welcome to Noon and Speak. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. How are you guys? Good. Am I correct about the respect thing? I mean, at the end of the day, when you're getting in your car after a show, all you want to have felt is the respect of the audience and respect of the people backstage. Is that correct? Very correct, because you receive what you put out. So I give respect, so therefore I give respect back. I never, ever consider myself better than anyone in the world, better yet than anyone in the company. So... I stayed humbled. I'm still very humbled. And it was just a wonderful opportunity for me to be on that stage. So it was all about respect. I was brought up and, that way. Very old school. Now, did those women backstage know that you were, in fact, an actual badass at, at any given moment? That you could have stretched any one of them? I, I mean, can't. it was so obvious. You were an athlete, baby. Yeah. I mean, I can't say what they thought, but... <laughs> Um, sometimes I would intentionally let them know that and feel that in the ring, but yet and still I did my job, what I was supposed to do as a professional inside the ring, to entertain the crowd and, and do my job and, and make the match, you know, one of the best matches of the night. So you have to ask them what they thought of their, <laughs> how they felt towards me as far as being a legit badass. <laughs> Well, it's funny because we had Crystal Marshall on recently and we had a great interview and it's being picked up by the dirt sheets and it's being well received. And the one comment one guy met was that, man, that girl's got a mouth like a truck driver, which I told her this morning by text and she laughed. But Crystal was like a little frilly girly girl. Like she was athletic because she's got an athletic field. And all these girls, these Trish Stratuses and leaders. Mm -hmm and Victoria's and Nydia's and Stacey Keebler's and all the people that you were around, like they became good wrestlers and good characters and good people for WWE, but you were an athlete. I mean, you had the physicality, you had the look, obviously picked up wrestling very quickly. You were really talented. I never saw you miss a spot. You had these crazy names for your finishing moves. I saw you put Trish in one of those one night, and I didn't think Trish was going to recover. So I'm not sure what the question is in there, but I would want to get people to remember for what you were. Like, I think my point with Crystal talked about Lita and her, quote, badassery. I mean, you brought badassery to a whole new level. Yeah, I mean, speaking of being an athlete, I mean, God just gave me a gift of being very capable of catching on to things easily. I remember in middle school, I had never picked up a basketball a day in my life. And one day I said, you know what? I want to play basketball. And I picked it up. Eighth grade year. Had no clue what basketball was. No fundamentals whatsoever. Ninth grade year, I get to high school. 
Well, during the summer, I played basketball every day. In fact, I had my own basketball goal. I put it on a tree at my house, and I played every single day. So my freshman year, of course, I wasn't a starter because we had, you know, top juniors and seniors on the, on the squad, but I most definitely came out and let them know that I was one to, to be looking forward to once I become a senior or junior because I, I was – uh, hustler of the year, most defensive player of the year. So I focused on trying to be the best. My goal was to one day to be called MVP of the team. And therefore, I bust my ass, and I did. I, I was like MVP of the basketball team, MVP of the track team, MVP of the softball team. So everything I always put myself and get involved in, my goal was to always be top dog, and that's just how it was with wrestling as well. Once I decided I wanted to become a professional wrestler, I wrestled every day. I, went, I trained seven days a week, and I guess that's how people hear my story, and, and a lot of people just don't get it. It's like I guess I was at the right place at the right time because, honestly, this is a God on his truth, and I put this on everything I, I have. I trained for six months, seven days a week, did a tryout with BCW. Two weeks later, they brought me in. I did my debut with the run-in on Cassidy, and that's how it all started. Six months of training, seven days a week. Later, I was debuting pay-per-view match in ECW. So it's just, I don't know if it was just God's gift that I was born with or just my work ethic. It may, I think it's a mixture of both, but I do thrive on just being the best, and I know the only the way to become the best is to work at it. So most people know you from WWE, but I think a lot of people would be really interested in a little more background from ECW. When people think ECW, like, I remember bouncing on Friday night in the late 90s, and about 1 o'clock in the morning, I'd see this bingo hall or wherever it was, yeah. and then I'd see these guys climbing ladders, and I remember these guys, the Dudley boys, like, going 15 feet and putting people through tables, and Raven, yeah. and Candido, and all these characters who were coming up, mm -hmm. you were actually in the mix there. I think I took everyone's finisher. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> C.W. Anderson. I mean, I took the spine buster. I thought maybe that was my gimmick at, at the time. <laughs> and, who, Jazz, who were the women there? It could have been only, like, you and Francine and, uh, and Beulah. Like, there weren't many women, correct? No, there wasn't very many women. Actually, Beulah was already gone before I even debuted there. Francine, Dawn Marie, and at the time, they were having bra and panty matches. So I thought that I wasn't going to fit in because that's not me. You can't envision Jazz out in the ring having a match in a bathing suit or you know, lingerie. Actually, I'm envisioning it right now, so don't hold yourself short there, okay? Well, I mean, you can probably envision it, but as far as character-wise, it's just what And I went in there green as hell. And those guys would be in the back going over matches and, and, and they're calling stuff, boom, boom, bang, bang. And I'm like, what the hell is a boom, boom, bang, bang? And I went in just learning things on the fly. They just threw me out there to the wolves. I observed and, and soaked everything in. Hey, it all worked out. <laughs> I mean, that's the God on his truth. A lot of people don't believe me when I say that, but I had to make it work. There was no doubt in my mind that it was going to be in the failure in my career when it came to me in this business. So, again, work at the kick-in, first one at the building every day in the ring, working on my craft every single day, every weekend. You know, we get there as soon as that ring set up. I'm right there in the ring working on something. I don't care if it was just a leg drop or an elbow drop. I wanted my leg drop to be different. I wanted my elbow drop to be different. So. It wasn't a Hulk Hogan leg drop for sure. I tried to make my leg drop look deadly. That's 
how I created my character. I wanted everything to look vicious and, and just look like I'm just killing a person. And Rodney, my husband, Rodney Mack, Red Dog, whatever you know him as, he has had a background at Greco-Roman wrestling. He actually uh, was a champion in high school of wrestling. So Another legitimate badass, by the way. Yeah, 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 yeah. He put that in my head to be like, we're going to be some freaking killers. So that's who we are, and we're going to be unstoppable. And that's what we brought to the table, and we let it be known to the wrestlers, to the fans, that we are legit badasses. And back then, there was no women doing much mad work. You know what I mean? Like, there was no chain wrestling. They were out there doing spots. And I focus on basics and technical, and that's why, again, being an athlete, I focus on, you know, footwork. A lot of things that people don't, don't think about, those are those, those small things that I really, really strive on, on perfecting. I hate happy feet. I hate to see people out in the ring and their feet just never stop moving. You're not an athlete. So I just thrived on being a top-notch athlete. And I guess, like you said, I guess some people recognized and some people didn't. But I thank you for recognizing that. I, I really do. Well, I mean, it's just so obvious. And the other obvious thing is that you would have been a star, whether it was the 1940s, the 1950s, the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, or the time you came in, because you have a very old school mentality. You're all about the preparation. You're all about the presentation. You're all about the studying of the craft and then performing accordingly. So you could have worked with Moolah years ago, or you could have worked with Sasha today if you follow the product at all, yeah. or whoever these people yeah. are right now. I can work with it's, anybody. I can work with someone who's never had a match before. If they had a few months of training, I can have a match with them. I am that type of person. I, I like to build the girl's confidence up. The nerves, oh my God, I'm working fast. Don't worry, sweetie, I got you. We're going to go out there and we're going to set the house down. It's all good. That's what I work on, and I love giving back. I was so lucky and blessed, and I was brought in. Like, Rodney and I, we were the greenhorn on the cars that, when we first started, that we were on. I mean, we're talking about the one-man gang, the Rod Price, the Junkyard Dogs, the Sam Houstons. I mean, these are the people that we broke in with, Grizzly Smith, Bubba Monroe. We broke in with people like that from the Mid-South era. Those were the people Jeff, that we were in the locker room with. What year are we talking right now? You're you're talking about we're some. Talking, you're talking. About, yeah, this is when I first first started. I'm talking about like ninety five, ninety six. Ah, see, I didn't know. I thought you were more like ninety eight. Boom, a two year run in well, ECW, you know, and then this, boom, this was, WWE. Was, You've been around no, a while. This was my indie. This was the six months of me training and the few matches wow. that I, I had. On the indies, it's like I'm saying, this was the type of the caliber of people that I was around. This is the caliber of people that drilling things in my ear. Hall of Famers. You got a yes. junkyard dog in your ear. Man. Yes. Doesn't get better yes. than that. Thanks. Hey, junkyard dog and I were roommates for a while while I was. <laughs> you know? I he love taught, that. He taught me the business. He didn't teach me much of wrestling. But for sure, traveling on the road with him, I really learned a lot about the business and how to conduct myself and present myself and how to be a professional and most definitely how to make money on the end. Johnny Gardal was a hustler, baby. <laughs> I've seen that man. If you pull out the 20, you're going to spend that whole 20 before you leave his face. He's going to take you take, take five pictures. If he's selling $5 a picture, you end up taking four pictures. He can the whole $20 bill. So he was a hustler. So we learned that about it's all about your merchandise. And it's just the business itself. Like I said, he wasn't a technical wrestler. And Junkyard Dog, he was more of like a brawler. And they play his music. They already know what's about to go down. He's about to go out there, boom, boom, bang, bang. And he would grab the rope, do his thing, howl, bark, and, you know, one, two, three, the match is over. But, um, yeah, I started training, like, the end of 96, 97. I moved to Louisiana and had, like, maybe two or three matches on the Indies. And, like I said, I was in ECW 98, and I had my first pay-per-view match. You know, I was doing house shows and all that. And I was 
part of Dustin Incredible's entourage on pay-per-views, but as far as a singles match, I debuted my singles pay-per-view match against Jace tonight at Heat Wave 99. And that was the birth of the female fighting phenom. That did it. Paulie, I said what I did, my tryout, it was, it was hilarious. I did my tryout, and RPD went to Roddy was like, hey, yo, dude, that, that's your girl, right? He was like, yeah. He was like, dude, like, you sure you want her to get in the ring? You know, like, like if she can get in the ring with Jason, dude, like, he's not going to hold back on it. You, 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 you sure? You sure about this? And Roddy's like, oh, yeah, I'm sure she's going to be all right. She's going to be okay. And what I mean, the entire locker room from ECW came around the ring, and it was like they were our audience, you know. I mean, they're banging on the apron. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I'm nervous, got butterflies. I'm about to pull on myself, and I'm like, what the hell? But we did our thing, and I hung in there with Jason, and whatever he gave, I gave it right back. And once we finished the match, I ran to the back because I was so nervous. I ended up throwing up. I'm in the locker room with you, kid, and Paulie's like, where is that girl? Where is she? Where is she? Rodney comes looking for me. Baby, baby, Paulie's looking for you. To get the stuff cleaned up. So I had to, like, hurry up and wash my mouth out. And he's like, who are you? Where the hell did you come from? You know, he's like, oh, my God, I've never seen anything like this. Well, where do you come from? And two weeks later, he called me and said, hey, I got a great idea. We're going to do this. Uh, Cassie and Sandman's on their way out to WCW. And we're going to bring you in to take Cassie's spot. And I was like, what? Yeah. We'll be flying you in. I'm like, fly? Like, I had never been flown on an airplane before, you know. So, I got that. And that was the birth. And I always give props to Paulie and Dreamer for seeing something different in me and something that I had to offer to the business. So, I really owe a lot of credit to uh, Dreamer and Paul Lee. And, of course, my husband for working with me every day in the freaking ring. Yeah, and, of course, yeah. And turning me into this, I guess, legit badass, like a shooter. That's what he called me in ECW. Shane Douglas, like, oh, my fucking God, you're a fucking shooter, <laughs> you know. How awesome. So that little moment, that small moment where you're in the ring and then you go backstage and you're so nervous, you got to puke. And then Paul Lee's looking for you, and he yeah. says, oh, my God, who are you? Where did you come from? You're amazing. Still, to this day, has yeah. to be one of the greatest yeah. moments legit. in your wrestling career. Yes, yeah, great, legit. Because I right. still had no clue what I was doing. It's yeah, and you're, and you're being so put over. You know? Yeah. 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 It was just like things that came natural, and me trying to catch on to what the boom, boom, bang, bangs are. Like, what is that? They're going back over there, and they change this, and they change that. And well, well, this is when you come in, Jazz, and you're going to do this, and you're going to do that. And I'm like, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God, okay, 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 okay. Uh, so I would go in a corner just like, okay, when they do this, and they do that, so man, that's when I get in the ring, and I got to do this, and I got to do that, and, and okay. And, okay, what's my cue again? What's the cue again? And, okay, okay, okay. So when he comes in there with the cane, and he turns around and hit him with the kick, and, okay, all right, that's okay. That's my cue. So literally, that's how I learned about the Higgies and the spots and all that. It was a hell of a spot to be in, a great opportunity, but it was very awkward to be thrown in that position and not knowing anything and to actually pull it off and make it work. And no one noticed a damn thing. No one knew I, I was green as shit, had no freaking clue of what I was doing, but again, to the gift of God of giving me a gift of being an athlete and picking up things quickly and yeah, that's just it, man. We start off the show with the word respect, and then here we are, I don't know, 25, 20 minutes into the show it is, and you're being shown the ultimate respect by some of the toughest SOBs in the business. How yeah. cool is that? And that's why, and that's why I can say later on that that's what I remember about you and Rodney in particular, the word yeah. that comes out, the headline is respect. Yeah, and whatever those guys did to me, every finisher I took, every chop I took, every slam I took, I got back up and I finished the match. Never bit, griped, ow, ooh, oh, oh, he's stiff, oh, God, that's killing me. 
I didn't put none of that shit over. None, none of it. So whatever they gave me, I was woman enough to take it and most definitely give it back. But that was Paulie's motto. Don't you get out there and treat her like no girl. Don't you treat her like no woman. And Jazz, don't you get out there and act like no woman. You get out there and you beat the hell out of her. You act like you stole money from you. You act like you slapped your mama. That's what I want to see out there. And I'm telling you guys, this is going to work. But he will literally tell those guys to get out there and beat the shit out of me. Do not hold back. So can you imagine me over there in the corner trying to warm up and get my mind right and going over spots in my head and I'm being I'm I'm listening to this man tell my opponent to go out there and beat the shit out of me. Like, whoa. But you know what? It worked. Like I said, I didn't write, I never bitch complain about anything. So again, that's where a lot of respect came in as well because I held my own. And it's like they had nothing to gripe about. Like the boys that had to put me over, I don't know any of them that really gripe much about it because I earned that, you know, and they saw that I put forth the effort to learn the crap. I wasn't like one that thought I was, you know, a superstar and thought I was too good to, to go out and do this or do too good to do what they asked me to do or whatever. I, I did it and I took it. Therefore, those guys, I mean, that's where the respect come in at. Jazz, let me ask you a question just for me and my audience because we need to be very clear on this because my next question is a follow-up question to this. He was known at the time as Paul Lee, and he later became Paul Heyman, correct? Correct. Okay. So I just wanted to clear that up because there are some people who don't know that he was one time Paul Lee. So could one argue that along with Rodney and along with Junkyard Dog and, of course, later Vince McMahon, which we're going to get to, that Paul uh-huh. Lee, Paul Heyman, is probably the most influential man in your wrestling past. Would that be a good assumption? Yes, always. I always put Paul Lee over in every interview. I always put him over because, first, at the time, there wasn't many African-American women in the business, especially on that level. He saw something in little old me. And he gave me an opportunity, and he knew I was different. They told me, please, whatever you do, you don't need no boob job. You don't need all this and that. Like, you're totally different, and that's going to make you different. That's going to set you out different, make you look different from any other girls. Never, ever consider of getting boobs or any of that. So that's why he came up with a motto of, my TNA don't stand for kids and ass. My TNA stands for talent and ability. So Paulie, he knew what he was doing with me, and he set the tone of who Jazz is and turned me into the female fighting phenom, like Paulie, Heyman, and Dreamer, which he had great mind for the game as well, but still do, you know what I'm saying? And they, this is what they saw in me, and, and they gave me my first opportunity to showcase what I had to offer to the business. All right, Jazz, we got to stop the presses here. We got to stop the presses because I have something to say. Now, you are painting a picture like I know you. And, of course, I do some research before my interviews because I want to know the bigger picture. But please, I know you've got to go to lunch with your family, but but we got to cover WWE. But I'm begging you right now to tell me, I knew you were special. I didn't quite know you were this special, okay? My plea to you right now is, please tell me that you are sharing this gift that you have, this gift that you've been given, all this preparation that you put in that became such a success story, please tell me you are sharing this with kids and organizations throughout the world. Because if you are not, my friend, you are missing the boat on something, but I have a feeling you're going to give me an affirmative answer. I always, every day, because believe it or not, I'm a correctional officer. Oh, my a, God. Uh, I didn't know that. Yeah, I'm a correctional <laughs> officer. So I tell these guys each and every day. I have, you know, they're no longer called inmates. They're called offenders. So I have offenders that work underneath me in food service. I'm over the warehouse. I take care of all the food that, that everyone eats inside the facility. 
and I try to tell them some positive every day. Just because you're in here doesn't mean you have to be and stay criminal-minded all the time. Why still sugar? Why can't you ask me, can you have sugar? Or can you have some ketchup? Why go steal it? Just ask. And then I try to tell them you have kids out there, and you don't want your kids to be in the same predicament you in. So when you get out of here, please go be a dad. If nothing else in this world, please go do something positive, get a job. I know it's hard. I said, it's a struggle. I said, I have a job. I'm struggling. I wrestle on weekends. I said, life is just a struggle. And you have to understand being legit in this world. So I try to do things the right way. You're going to always get faced with temptations. The devil is busy, but you got to put God first. You most definitely got to have God in your life. That's most important. And if God is in your life, you can't do no wrong. It's hard to have a legit job when you sold drugs all your life and you're used to making this fast money and you work every day and you get a check for four or five hundred dollars a week and you gotta pay bills and put food on the table. That's hard. It just really is. And that's where the temptation comes in at. But I tell them, but you have to have faith in God in order for you to be there for your kids and to be there for your wife or your girlfriend, the mother of your kids. You have to put God first, and you got to go out in the world and be legit. You have to be legit and stay positive. You have to. That's the key to life. That's the key to life. So I try to share something positive every day with these offenders and kids. I try to tell my kids the same thing. Like, there's no need to lie about anything. You can always tell mom and dad the truth, no matter how bad you think it is. We'll always work through it. We'll teach you. Sometimes that's a part of life. Doing wrong is a part of life. And the only way you can learn sometimes of what's right is doing wrong. So I always try to stay positive. I guess that's why I feel like I have a garden angel watching over me all the time because I focus on doing the right things each and every day. I try to live right by God, live right by my family, my kids. And opportunities just keep knocking on the door. I'm right there at the door, and opportunities are right there. Every time I open the door, there's another opportunity. There's another opportunity. But that's because I try to live right. Yes? Yes. Um, I'm going to say something to you right now. I'm a 60-year-old man. I'm at the point in my life where I don't give a shit anymore. I shoot up. I show up. I do my podcast. I got a full-time job. I only talk to people I want to talk to. I talk uh-huh. to people who are cool or I have a fond memory of. I'm just going to throw this out. Yeah, you know I got no reason to blow smoke up your ass because it's not WWE. I'm not going to get something out of it. You're incredible. You really are. You're an incredible woman. Thank you. Thank you. And I hope you're owning it on a daily basis how incredible you are. Well, I mean, this is just who I am. I don't fake the funk. I, I, I'm, I don't yeah, think the the world. <laughs> Darling, you're, you're just, I got a smile on my face. I just love this story. And we haven't even told half of it. But now we got to move. ECW folds up shop. This is the way I remember it. And at least the historical narrative is this. Mm-hmm. ECW ends. It packs up. It's not working. And then uh-huh. you somehow make it over to... The big show. So now you're at Ollie. WWE and shit's about to get, now you're going to be paid off yes. for your hard work. So how did I that don't... happen? And then who's in the locker room your first day in terms of the women at WWE? All right. I got to back up. We got to rewind a little bit. Okay. First off, oh yeah, okay. ECW fold, right? Next thing you know, Who's commentating? Ali. All right. So, Rodney and I, we moved to Texas. We live in Fort Worth. We're, we're doing indies. And, you know, still we, we're still trying to make it to WWE. That was our ultimate goal. So, um, on an indie show, we run into Dreamer. He's there. He's like, hey, I'm going to talk to Paul. You know, he's commentating now. He's over there. And, see if I can get to a dark match, okay? I was like, okay, cool. So, I mean, my work ethic never stops. Sit in the gym every day. Rod and I have our own training facility in Texas. We're training. 
we're actually using our trainees to, to make us better, you know? <laughs> anyway, I get the call for the dark match, and I get there. Ivory's in the locker room. Molly Holly's in the locker room. Watch, which I had met Molly Holly a few times at ECW shows. I think she was in WCW at the time. We was near, I guess, her neck of the woods, and she was stopped by. I got to meet her a few times, and I was told I was going to wrestle Ivory for my dark match. So I was like, hey, lady, how are you? You know, I, I love Ivy. She has the, the greatest personality I ever met in my life. She's, she's an awesome, awesome, awesome lady. She goes, how are you? I'm like, I'm good. I'm like, a pleasure to meet you, you know, blah, 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 whatever. She goes, yeah, I heard so much about you. Unfortunately, you know, I've never watched your work or anything, but Molly says you're freaking awesome, and she, she loves you. She puts you over all the time. I was like, whoa, really? I was like, well, thank you, she said. So tonight is your night. We're going to make sure that you go out there and you shine bright like a diamond. It's all about wow. you. We're going to make it all about you, okay? Wow. So I appreciate that. So we went out there and we did our dark match. And when we come back, they said that that was the, the biggest crowd reaction they've ever had from a women's dark match ever in the history of WWE. Woo! I love yes. it. So kudos to Ivory for looking out. Yeah. And that's why, because the way she came to me and what she did for me, I did for others. Every female that came in that building for a tryout to get a job, I was the first one to step in that ring and work out with them so they can showcase their talent, their craft, in front of the agent for them to get a job. Because... That's how I felt they opened their arms up to me and allowed me to come there and gave me an opportunity to showcase my talent on that big stage. So I had to give back. But that's, that's the story of the start. So Polly tells me, Dad, yeah, freaking out. He comes back there. He hugs me. He's like, God, I love you, kid. You're wonderful. He's like, I promise you, a couple of weeks, you'll hear something. I guarantee. So I'm pulling my thumb, two weeks go by, nothing, nothing, nothing. Another week goes by, nothing. Three weeks, a month. All right, about the second month, I get a phone call. Yes? Like, yes? Uh, Johnny Lavernitis. <laughs> Johnny Lavernitis. <laughs> I go, who? <laughs> Johnny Lavernitis from the WWL. I'm like, who? <laughs> <laughs> Johnny Lavernitis from the WWL. It's like, I've heard a lot about you, kid. Um, we're interested in you. I hate to tell you this. I've never really seen you work. Don't know much about you, but I've heard about you. And wow. I'm interested in you. And you'll be getting a contract in the mail in the next couple of days. Give me your address. We'll be sending you the contract. And you're probably going to Kentucky to OVW for our training camp. And I was like, oh, my God. I I couldn't, I, I think when I hung that phone up, like, I couldn't believe, like, what just happened. So, there you have it. Paper comes in, sign my contract. A couple of weeks later, they tell me to go to Kentucky. JR tells me, well, he, he was the only one that called me by my real name. Carlene, we're going to get you down there in OBW just to knock off the ring rust because we know you hadn't been in the ring long. So, then we'll get you up really soon. Okay, so I go to OBW I'm down there, and we're training, we're training. A lot of people are having, uh, they're in programs because they were actually running TV out there. So I actually couldn't really participate much because Cornette was like, you know how Cornette is. Like, if he's going to start something, he's going to finish it. So he's like, I can't put you in a storyline because I don't know when the hell they're going to bring you up. So I just had to sit around there, train every day, and just wait. So... We had a weekend off or something. I said, well, I'm going to go home and visit family and um, just check on everything. So I'll see my dad, my mom, and everybody. And uh, while I'm on vacation, I get a call that says, we need you here Monday night. You're going to do a run. And I'm like, what? I have no clothes. I'm like, I just brought clothes. I'm just visiting my parents. Like, I have nothing. They're like, don't worry. Whatever you have, just get here. Your flight, where are you at? I said, I'll be flying out of Memphis. They're like, okay. The flight's going to be ready to be there for the time. We're going to bring you up. That's when I did my run in on Trish. Damn, girl! 
Yes. I did my run in on Trish, and then um, I think I came out for the uh, was it the Royal Rumble? Yeah, 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 yeah. Now is China gone, or is China at the very end of her career at WWE? I saw China there one Monday, and right. I never saw her there again. Yeah, because that's weird. where I. It's weird because. I went there and she was like in a corner by herself, you know. Yeah, she, I had she was heard stories, but I didn't really. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I didn't really know, but me, out of respect, like this China, I went to do, introduce myself, and she didn't even reach her hand out, extend her hand out whatsoever, try to shake my hand and say hello or anything. I was like, whoa, okay. Yeah, so, no kid. Again, you know, that was that was something new because in ECW, we were a family. Friday, Saturday. Sunday, every day we get to the building, we shake hands, we hug, you know, hey, hey, hey. I mean, every weekend, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, we get there for a do, shake hands and hug. That's how we greet each other in ECW. And then you so get to the WWE, and it's like, you, you don't know if you should speak, you don't know what to do. Yeah, you know? it's yeah. Like, it's a whole different world over there. So I just set up and sat back and, and just observed and, and did what I was told. And the first house show, they're like, all right, kid, you're going to go out there, you're going to do this, but you're going to be a heel. I'm like, I'm going to be a who? You're going to be a heel. I'm like, I've never been a heel before because I was a face in ECW. You know, I was always a face because I was working the guy, you know. Even though I was just incredible as a heel entourage, but as far as wrestling, I was a baby face. So I was like, okay, never been a heel one day in my life. So I go out there, house show. And just did what I thought because I studied film. Anyway, I, I, I studied everyone. You know, Tully Blanchard, I studied the Four Horsemen, Bob Ord. I studied people like that anyway because I love that style of wrestling. I love that style of sale, you know, just all of that, how to put people over and everything. So I just went out there and and did what I thought a hill should do. And when I walked back to the back, Arn Anderson called Crowbar. <laughs> Crowbar, you did a hell of a job, kid. Hell of a hill. You're going to be a force to be reckoned with. Let me tell you that right now. You hear me? Listen to the words I'm telling you. You're going to be freaking great, kid. You're going to be freaking great. I love it. I love it. I love it. So from then on, I just focused on just studying all heels. And then once I got in there with Fit, Fit said, you're going to be a killer. You're going to be a monster. I was like, huh? He's like, yep, you're going to be a monster. And he worked with me every day, of course. Again, first one to the building, first one dressed, first in the ring. We're ready to work out, work on some things. And that was Sid working out on some things. And and that was the beast. He turned me into that beast. That's what he wanted, and that's what he got. So thanks to Sid Finley, I was that bad bitch. That's the one who, so- who saw what I already had, but added a little more to the gift that I was already given. So he just tweaked it a little bit and, and turned it into something totally different. So now you're becoming the badass bitch or and then, the and then there's bitch. another the baddest uh, bitch. Okay. The, and you've got finishing moves called the nasty DDT, the cradle, which is a fisherman brain buster, sometimes from the second rope. You got the jazz stinger. You got the yeah. sit out front power slam. You got the STF transition yeah. from a single leg Boston Crab. Your signature yeah. moves are the back body drop, the backhand chop, the bitch clamp, the double yeah. underhook suplex, the eye rake, the low drop kick, the modified clover leaf, the chicken wing muda lock, the running leg drop, the running splash, the Blackjack oh drops God. into a hangman and the single leg Boston <laughs> Crab. What the fuck? Hey. <laughs> <laughs> you are yeah. one badass woman. Thanks for reminding me this. Now I got to uh, thank you. I forgot some of that shit. Thanks. But you were like a lockup machine, man. Like, I would imagine that Lita, even though you're taking care of Lita and Lita's taking care of you, and even though Trish Stratus is taking care of you and you're taking care of her, they must be going into a match with you saying, man, I got my work cut out for me tonight. Well, 
first of all, they knew that I was going to make them look like a freaking superstar. I was going to make them shine bright like a freaking diamond. They knew. I mean, Trish loved for me to take her finisher. She was like, oh, my God, I love the way you take my finisher. Like, I took I them. I didn't took Trish Stratosphere. Trish did the whatever. She had a, a Stratus every damn thing. And I took it. Took it. <laughs> The stratus faction, the stratus fear, the stratus kick, the stratus this, the stratus that. <laughs> so you're thrown into the mix with probably five Hall of Famers. Yeah, and my job was to, to freaking go out there and, and make them look good. I mean, a lot of people, I've heard stories that Trish put me over about who actually gave her the credibility of being a legit fucking wrestler. Because before I got there, she just had pretty much started wrestling a little bit before I got there. You know, she had some matches, but when I came, it, like, totally went into a whole different gear. Like, we, we turned it up, like, five five notches. Did she thank you I in her know. Hall of Fame speech? I think I was mentioned. I really don't watch wrestling now, but I try to, like, check the girls out and just try to see what they're doing. They're doing shit totally different than what I was doing. I mean, I wasn't leaving the ground for no damn body, you know, not even for Vince McMahon. I never took a backdrop. I just didn't feel comfortable being off the ground. <laughs> you probably you never noticed, but I never have taken a backdrop. I give them because I know I'm capable of, of lifting you and protecting you. But as far as me trusting someone to freaking pick me up and lift me up and do this and that. I, I was very skeptical, but that's why I worked out and became very muscular because I was a horse. I was a mule. So I had to lift people up and do this and do that. They came up with all these damn finishers, which required to be picked up and lift up. I'm like, God damn, come up with a finisher where you can just do some shit by your damn self. Shit. <laughs> you don't require me to fucking work seven minutes nonstop, then I got to fucking pick you up over my head for you to do your finisher. Like, Jesus Christ. So yeah, I mean, right. I had to, like, I had my work put in, put out for me. I had to, like, bust ass and prepare myself for all that, you know, but I did it. So I want to ask you, uh, there are a couple of obvious questions that I want to ask you, and then I have a Rodney question, not for Rodney, but through you, I'm going to ask a question about Rodney. But before I do that, just a side note. Um, I saw a picture of you on the internet. You got some mad ink on you right now, right? Yes. <laughs> you got pretty heavily into the ink for a little while. Though. You look great, that by the way. The midlife, I think midlife crisis, something totally different. I was leaving the wrestling business and going to get a shoot job, which I had had a shoot job since, you know, I had started wrestling in the 90s. And it was just I had kids and it was just, I had to figure out, okay, do I say goodbye to wrestling and, and, and what do I do? And, and I knew I had to do what was best for my kids. And that was to go get a job. I needed insurance. So it was just a midlife crisis thing I, I went through. I kind of hate I did it. I, I really don't like the ink. I, I really regret that I did it. But a lot of people compliment it, you know. But there's a lot of things on there that means a lot to me that I, I did get some things that, it was personal to me on my arm, so, yeah. but. You and I have a lot in common in this sense. Our timeline in wrestling, and of course I wasn't a wrestler, I was just a security guy, but our timeline almost is, is almost perfectly in sync. Uh, you left a little before me, but your run was almost as, as long as mine. And then in the midlife crisis mode, we both got a lot of ink on us. I'm heavily inked on my arms right now. And I'm almost on a weekly basis adding new stuff just because it's my artistic thing and I dig it and, it, and I'm having fun with it and people comment on it. And uh, yeah, and I'm getting heavily in. So we, in that respect, and, and I'm about respect. I mean, I hope that always came across that I was a respectful guy. So you and I have a lot in common. And I'm glad, I'm, it's weird. I'm glad you remember a, a lot about me. I mean, it's, it's it's weird that you all the shit you just said and named. I'm like, damn, I need to because go back to YouTube and reminisce and, and and think about some things. Because it comes back to the way we started the show. It comes back to respect. 
You and I didn't have to be buddies. You didn't I have to be all huggy and happy to be at a back yeah. year with each other every day for a long time. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. you mm-hmm. were all about respect. And that's the shit I remember. OK, yeah. so it's about yeah. respect and it's about, you know, and that's why I remember you, uh, Stephanie, yeah. Hunter and Vince, the holy triumvirate up at WWE. Could you give me your take on uh, a uh, how what your relationship was with them, any interactions with them and what's happened to them that they have become? I mean, they were already giants when you were there, but now they are the gold standard in wrestling. Stephanie yes. Vince and uh, Stephanie Vince and Hunter. Yeah, I remember my first pay per view match with Trish, and at the time, I, they were still putting me up in the uh, office hotel, as we call it. You know, the office stayed at a hotel, then the talent go get their own room elsewhere. You don't want to be in a hotel with the office. So anyway, I'm staying at the hotel where Vince and everyone's staying. I'm there in line waiting at the counter to get my room and Vince and Miss Linda walks in and Vince shakes my hand. He's like, kid, great freaking job. That was an awesome match tonight. And I was like, holy moly. Vince McMahon just shook my hand and gave me a compliment. So that alone right there, uh, that, that's a standout moment just alone right there as far as WWE goes or F at the time. So Stephanie was someone I looked to her as, because she was a woman, I looked to her as someone that I could go to and talk to where maybe she can understand me as far as just being a woman in this, you know, male-dominant business, you know. So I don't know. I'm the type of person, I just feel like I can talk to anybody. I feel like everybody put their pants on the same way as I put mine on, one leg at a time. So I never looked at them as God and Jesus as far as that, but I respect them because I knew they were the bosses, you know, but I still would go up to Stephanie and be like, hey, what's up, Steph, you know, yada, 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 whatever, you know. That's just the type of person I am. I just feel like no one is perfect or beyond God or someone that's unapproachable to where you can't go and talk to. So maybe I was wrong on doing those things, but hey, I'll go up and say, hey, the Vince, what's going on? How you doing? I mean, at any given moment. And I'm like that now at work. You know, you have this rank. You got your sergeant, you got your lieutenant, and you got your captain. But you know, I don't care. I'd be like, what's up, Cap? What's going on? How you doing today? What's up, Lou? You all right? Just <laughs> That's just how I am. I, I like to talk. I'm a sociable person. I'm a people person, you know. And I think that's why um, a lot of girls, respect me in, in this business, well, I, I feel that because I never looked down upon anyone, no matter if they was six months in the business or the six years in the business, just because I've been at WWE, yeah, for whatever, doesn't make me any better than them. That's how I approach them. <laughs> so this inner strength comes from someplace. Does it come from your mom or your dad? I don't know. I think it's my dad. I really don't know. I just think it's me. Sometimes Rodney would, you know how many times I've been kicked underneath the freaking table by Rodney by saying, shut up. He's always, you, 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 you say too much sometimes. I'm like, I'm sorry, but <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I'm, I'm sorry. Just I have no fear of speaking how I feel, you know, it's just, I guess. My dad taught me that. It's like, and so did Junkyard Dog. A closed mouth won't get fed. Fuck, if you want to know an answer, you got to ask the question, right? Yeah. Uh, my Rodney question. So you're married to Rodney, Rodney how many years? 18 years. But we've been together 18 like years. 20, 21 so, Yeah, 18 years. So knowing you two, not knowing you two, but having worked with you two, I uh-huh. would imagine you two talk strategy you two talked about the business you talked about your matches afterwards so assuming yeah. that that's correct i remember correct. rodney when one of the highlights of his of his career is that he had the white boy challenge yeah. i remember so much the white boy challenge every week they were bringing in the white boy so rodney could <laughs> crush him okay yes yeah. 
Now, if I'm not mistaken, and mm-hmm. there seems to be some question about this, if I'm not uh-huh. mistaken, they brought in a kid one night, probably the whitest kid on the planet Earth, and he <laughs> wore these little white shorts, and he went by the name of Brian Danielson. Do you remember that? I remember that, yeah. Okay, yeah. so you remember Brian Danielson, who later became Daniel Bryan, or whatever the hell his name is, and became one of the uh-huh. biggest things in wrestling history. So am I correct yes. that there was a match between Rodney and Daniel Bryan, and Rodney crushed him? I believe so, yes. There was, there was a bunch okay. of them. I mean, it, and, it, was a, it was a bunch of them. I, I remember one time this kid called his mom. He's like, Mom, be sure to watch the show tonight. I'm about to wrestle Rodney Mack in the whiteboard challenge. Please watch it. Please watch it. <laughs> and believe it or not, Rodney said that was the hardest shit ever. <laughs> Kick ass for three minutes nonstop. I mean, sometimes it will be two in there at a time. You know, it's like, shit, you had to be in shape to go out there and just pounce, pounce, pounce for three minutes nonstop. Just beat the shit out of somebody. Man, that that was a job. <laughs> and if I'm not mistaken, Rodney had a work ethic like you because I never saw Rodney get blown up. No, actually, Rodney, he's the one who helped me stay focused and 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 he's the one who told me he's like baby you got to get in the gym because you're going to be different like you you're, you're going to be totally different so you're you're going to be the workhorse in the matches because the way you look the way you're built and, and you're you're being an athlete that you are he's like so please trust and believe in what I'm telling you so he's the one who worked with me in my groundwork and all that he's like is totally different. Like, there's no other girls doing this. Like, no other girls doing groundwork the way the way I was doing. Like, I'm in there, like, like legit stretching the shit out of people. I mean, I, I got a good story to tell you, but I don't want to get off track. But, um, but yes, Rodney has a work ethic out of this freaking world, dude. It's like, he's really a beast. Like, legit, like, straight up. He's a beast when it comes to working out. And he's yeah. a man. And he demands respect, like no one's gonna disrespect him whatsoever. Nicest guy you can meet. Very nice, soft spoken, very humble, very thankful for everything, but please don't piss him off. Please. We've got him out of so many different places, you know. <laughs> <laughs> And Jazz, there's a reason I bring this up because years later I left WWE and then Dave Batista came to me. And he said, hey, Noon, somebody told me you got some chops in the acting business. He says, you got a camera? And I said, I got a friend who's got like a a $2,000 camera. He goes, I want to do this tribute to my wife, and I want to travel around the country, and I want to do this video in between wrestling about uh, Batista Hates Cancer as a tribute to my girl, Angie. And we're going around, and one day we're in Detroit, and Uh there's this guy who's making a real place for himself in WWE, but... He was a guy years earlier that when he was doing dark matches, I had to treat him badly because that's what we did when mm-hmm. people came in from dark exactly. matches. I was instructed uh-huh. by Johnny Ace pretty much to like put him in a broom closet, right? And one of the guys was Daniel Bryan, right? And make sure, make sure, and make sure they don't eat too much in catering, okay? Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And this guy's coming up, and he's he's really making a name for himself with the Yes Movement, and. I'm not with WWE anymore. We're working out in the hotel gym because Dave put me up at the TV hotel. Say, hey, Noons, where you been? How you doing? Good to see you. And there's this guy in the gym named Daniel Bryan. And I go, oh, I remember you. You used to do dark matches. And you were in the White Boy Challenge. And he says, no, I wasn't. I said, excuse me? He goes, oh, I wasn't in a White Boy Challenge. I go, uh, yeah, you were. And then he kind of walked away from me. So I was like, holy shit. You know, there was like some revisionist history going on there that he wanted to change mm-hmm. some kind of idea that he wasn't the guy who used to do dark matches because now he's the biggest guy on the planet. So I always yeah. was curious about that and, and like, you know, why he wouldn't own up to that, so to speak, for one simple minute mm-hmm. with a guy who obviously mm-hmm. knew the business. But I remember him getting squashed by Rodney in the White Boy Challenge. I remember his silly little white trunks because you would think he would wear something dark and he denied it. So I just thought that was kind of funny, little side story. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I would be proud of every moment I ever had in WWE. Dark match, if I worked 50 dark matches, hey, 
You know, I did that. Darling, <laughs> darling, not that many people can say are. that, hey, I did a dark match for WWE. <laughs> because that's who you are, and that only makes it a better story. You know, it's a better story. This is a success story. This is such a success story, Jazz. And I learned so much today from you that I'm going to ask you the last question. And the last mm-hmm. question is, you got to get to lunch, and Jimbo has got a day off, and I'm going to go smoke cigars with the boys and play poker. Uh, I got a day oh, off. Yeah. So my last question is, when does Jazz go into the WWE Hall of Fame? I can't answer that. <laughs> I have no idea. Jazz may never be in the Hall of Fame. I don't know. I don't know. No, Jazz, I can't answer no, that. No, no, Jazz is going into the Hall of Fame. Jazz is I, going. Hey, I don't know. I don't know. But let me <laughs> tell you this. Jazz was the last WWF Women's Champion, the first WWE Women's Champion, and I never lost the belt. Never lost the WWE Women's Championship belt. We, we had a battle roll where you get thrown over the top. I never got thrown over the top. I was eliminated from the bottom, and the ref didn't see it, blah, 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 whatever, whatever. But technically, I never lost the title. So as of now, still today, I am really still the WWE Women's Champion. I don't know what they're All called right. today. I think they got, I think it's another name, whatever, but I don't know. But I'm going to ask you a favor. Uh-huh. Uh, assuming that Noonan Speaks is still on the air, because I got a feeling it's going to be sometime soon, my favor is, can I be your first interview after you get inducted into the Hall of Fame? Yes, yeah, just make sure you stay in touch with me now. I'm going to stay in touch with you. I want to be your right. first interview after you become a Hall of Famer. You're already a Hall oh of Famer. God. Between you and between you and Kevin Nassar at 365, I don't know what I'm going to do with you two. Because Kevin's like, you got to give me the first interview. You got to give me the first. I'm like, dude, I may never make the Hall of Fame. I don't know. <laughs> nah, you're going to be in the Hall of Fame, baby, because you're a class act. You are a ferocious woman. Um, my request to you, I always make a request to my guests, but, but it's a legit request. And my request is that you, if God is willing, and if, and, uh-huh. and if it's meant to be that you, I, I'm not talking about podcast. I'm not talking, I'm talking about like, I'm talking about the speaking circuit. I'm talking okay. about you as a role model for kids, as a role model for women, as a role model for African-American women, a a role model for making it. I'm hoping, and my request to you is that you somehow make this happen, because this is a great story that needs to be shared, and I see you talking to people and like getting a standing ovation afterwards, telling your story, because it's a powerful story, and I am honored from the bottom and the top and the sides of my heart i am honored to have this uh, interview today because i learned so much and i think our audience has learned so much that you're just not jazz the phenom and jazz the two-time wwe champion you are a force reckoned with my friend and i got no reason to (laughs) poke up your butt you know i'm i'm just being i'm just being real i grew up with seven women and I know a strong mm-hmm. woman when I see one, and I want you to share this story. And and however that happens, you know, I I I, I challenge you to make that happen because you can help a lot of people, and you can help a lot of kids, and you can help a lot of people in general. You're a powerful Thank woman, you. and I'm Thank thrilled. To, I'm thrilled to have heard this story today. Thank you. Thank you. And there, and there's so much we we didn't get to talk because we don't have time, but. There's a lot more to the story. There's a lot more to to Jazz. There's a lot more to Carleen Begno. It's, it's, it's a lot. And I'm anxious to one day to possibly have me a book. I have stories to tell as far as just my personal life before I even even consider the the wrestling part of me. There's so much of Carleen people doesn't know about, and there's so much of Jazz that people has no clue about. So, you know, if, so if, if that ever, if that ever happens, 
if that Hall of Fame ever happens, I, I don't worry. I got you. I got you. Good, there's good. a story that I want to tell, and I'm hoping one day it's going to be in a book, and I hope it'll be one of the top selling books at that particular time. And I can't see how it wouldn't be. You're a power to be reckoned with. Please send my love to Rodney, another person who is all about respect, quiet, yeah. unassuming, just like you backstage, but two people yeah. I kind of dug and I totally respected, and I hope that came across to you today, how much I respect you and, and how much I cared for you guys. Yeah, most definitely, and I, and I really appreciate that from the bottom of my heart. I really do. I really God bless do. you. Thank you for it. going down memory lane. More Back fun, down more. memory lane. Yeah, <laughs> there you go, kid. I love you. God bless. Uh, have a great lunch. My love to the family. My love to Rodney. Please, much respect. Well and uh, And keep on trucking. And uh, I'm sure we're going to be talking at least in the next couple of years uh, on yeah. the uh, on Noonan Speaks after you get into the Hall yeah. of Fame because that's a shoo-in. I have one question to you before we Yes, ma'am. Yes. Why the how many Jimmys were there in WWE? Okay, great question. In the beginning, when you when What's you first name, came Jimmy? up, Jimmy. when you first came up, there was Tan Jimmy. There yeah. Was, there was Ponytail Jimmy. There yes. was Black Jimmy, Jimmy Tillis. Black there was Jimmy, Jimmy, yes. Stone Cold Jimmy, Jimmy Noonan, and then there was a guy named Terry who Hunter, for some reason, called Crackhead Terry Jimmy. Oh my God. So there were five or six of us, and we replaced Jim Dotson. So oh. there's, a, there's a history of Jimmy's at WWE. Yes. But it, it yes. came down I never knew that story. I'm like, I'm like, why the hell is all the the security is freaking Jimmy? Like, we were all Jimmy's. We were all from Northern New Jersey, and we all just happened wow. to be Jimmy's, and we had a great time on the road. But sooner or later, it had to end. Man, it was yes. great. Oh, the road was brutal, you know? Yes, so, yeah. People don't realize that. They think it's lips in the glam and the limousine ride and all that. It's like you have no clue. <laughs> you're the best, yeah, kid. Go yeah, have yeah. a great lunch, okay? All right. Thank you. and George. Take care. Thank you. Take care of yourself. All right. Later. Bye. Bye.